Hi everyone, uh, my name is Peter Mullins. I'm the guy that emails you. So uh, welcome, it's great to, great to see you all. Uh, so I'll be the master of ceremonies for the uh, Ask Me Anything. So I uh, appreciate everyone asking, asking questions. We've already got up to 14, so that's great stuff. Um, so what I'll do is I'll just go ahead and start. Uh, first off, first question was, can you talk a little bit about your roadmap for the next year or so? Uh, potential payment method distribution integrations, et cetera. So um, the, the interesting thing, so there's a few interesting things going on here. First of all, I can talk a little bit about the, the near-term roadmap because we have some things about to start, some things in flight. Um, and then I can talk a little bit about some exciting, exciting developments for us in the, in the product arena. So in-flight things that we're working on, um, this actually got, uh, Brianne mentioned this in her lightning talk, we're about to uh, launch into doing card level account updater. So you'll be able to take your vault and actually flag um, it'll be a negative flag. So you'll be able to go in and say, I don't want this card to run through AU. So especially for a lot of those uh, folks who are on uh, uh, running marketplaces and platforms, um, this becomes an issue because maybe some merchants you want to run through account updater, uh, maybe some merchants you don't around whether you're able to pass those costs on, et cetera. So um, that will be rolling out or the, the work on that will be starting here shortly. Um, who has checked out the new Sweetly dashboard? I think Peter emailed you about that. Um, so we just launched this new dashboard, and um, one of the other things that we're about to start doing is just some, some iterative work. We actually, um, I don't know how many of y'all have heard of Conway's Law, but Conway's Law is the idea that uh, computer systems and architectures end up reflecting the organizations that build them. And early on in Spridley's life, we had a bunch of senior engineers who were all working on individual projects, and so we ended up with a whole bunch of individual uh, experiences. So we had a debug app, and we had a support app, and we had a dashboard app, and we had another dashboard app. And so we've uh, just recently done some work to consolidate those down, and now we're able to iterate faster inside of that. And we have a team that's working on that and, and is going to be working on improvements inside of our dashboard. So those are some of the short-term things. Um, and then the really exciting thing that we've done just recently is we've hired a uh, full-time um, VP of product. Uh, we would have put him up here and made him answer this question, but we, he literally started like two weeks ago or three weeks ago, so we thought that wasn't quite fair. Um, but he is going to be digging into some of those longer bets and longer-term things and starting to help us map out 2019. Um, we've always driven a lot of our innovation and the, the things we've done directly off of uh, customer requests. And we'll continue to do that, we'll continue to use that feedback, but we want to look at some bigger picture stuff, try to understand not just what our existing customers want, but what future customers will want, or things that you would want if you knew that we could offer them to you. So that's kind of the next level of things that Daniel's going to be digging into over the, the coming quarter or so. He's over here, if you want to pester him, again, he's only three weeks in, so be nice, we don't want him to run away screaming yet, um, but uh, he is here, and he would love especially to talk to anyone who has feedback for him. Daniel. <laughs> okay, terrific. So, uh, next question. Spreely handles traditional payment options very well. Do you plan to support alternate payment methods in the future, specifically Arna? Can we hide? So, it's a great question, uh, and, it's a, and it's a constant recurring question is the idea around support for alternative payments. It's definitely in the bucket, those sort of three or four things that we're looking at. Um, and that we're looking at in terms of roadmap and prioritizing. Uh, I think the really interesting thing around alternative payments is we want to integrate them in a way that uh, is similar to the experience we have with credit cards, which is you can change out the provider on the back end and still process credit cards. Could you change out the provider on the back end and still keep support for your alternative payments? Uh, so making sure it's not mapped to a, uh, seeing if we can do it that way. Uh, and I think in just, in, you know, as it relates to product and the roadmap. For us, as you all know, and most of you really appreciate that we're this low level set of APIs that you can build on top of, the sort of philosophical discussion that, that we're having internally that Daniel is helping us drive is how do we do more without suddenly going too far up the stack and building finished products. So we look at things like data. We have all this data that you can access via the API. And if you want to invest the time and energy and we've done a few little things there. You can see, hey, how success, how, how am I doing in terms of successful transactions? 
declines, maybe by region, maybe by payment type. We're thinking about how do we build things that actually are, you can come in and see a dashboard in real time. So we're still providing the same broad set of APIs, but we're giving you actionable data where you come and see a dashboard and see how you're doing by car type, by region. Uh, we're thinking about the same thing. Uh, it, it, that's sort of general concept of how do we extend without moving too far away from the reason you're all here, which is this really flexible set of uh, APIs. So that's the sort of philosophical discussion we want to have. We want to provide more value like that for you uh, without suddenly having this sort of stack creep and, and we've got a rate baked for a solution we want you to use or a, or a concrete set of, uh, of BI tools. Okay. How about any plans to support SAML single sign-on for um, onto the admin pages? I mean, I hmm. think one of the things that we're working on um, with, again, consolidating into a single dashboard and really on the side of how you interact with the back end of Spreely, uh, web UI, et cetera, we're working on consolidating that into a single um, code base. And one of the ideas there is adding on those enterprise features. I don't know about SAML specifically. Um, We'd like to add two-factor authentication. We'd add, like to add better account management um, so that you can go in and have multiple levels and, and more control over uh, your API keys, et cetera. So improvements are coming in that area. Um, again, feedback to Daniel, um, feedback to us around what your highest priority is there, but um, we don't yet have specific sample plans. Great. So you've already met uh, Nathaniel and Justin. Uh, Ryan Daigle is our director of engineering. This, this uh, question was, Directed to you, but of course I'll throw it out to, to anyone. Can you talk a little bit about how you deal with scaling payments, especially for big spikes, like on, for instance, SeatGeek's uh, on-sale spikes? Yeah, we, um, you know, we do a lot of things. You heard a lot of our engineers talk about React, um, which does a great job with availability. The, an interesting wrinkle with what we do is that you know, very little bit, very little of the total payment processing time, like when you make an API call to Spreedly and say it takes. 300 milliseconds to several seconds to return to you, Spreely is adding 20 to 50 milliseconds across what is then happening downstream. So a lot of our performance is, you may, you may be seeing it and witnessing it via Spreely, but a lot of it is downstream performance issues and, and, um, and processing time. So a lot of what we are doing now in the move to AWS and how we've architected our systems is in um, making sure and, and minimizing the effect that downstream degradations have on the Spreely systems. And anything that's happening downstream, you know, we try to isolate it as quickly as possible and return, um, return failures if we, we already know the gateway is down so we can return failures quicker. A lot of times that, that determinism and, and being that explicit up front helps you do your jobs better. It gives you known error states that you can actually work with and deal with on your side. Um, so, you know, we... we we're kind of in this, this interesting spot, of, as, as we've talked about many times, in our place in, in the payment processing stack. So we kind of have to deal with performance issues at maybe a slightly different level or in a different way. It's more about isolating um, issues than maybe uh, for somebody that has full control over the whole stack, or the whole technical stack. Yeah, and I will say we have um, not just CP, but we have other customers, and uh, two redsheds here. Um, we, we have other customers that do large on sales. So we always kind of pay attention to those because those are interesting sort of stress tests for the system. And a lot of those customers give us uh, prior warning that those things are happening. And so we keep an extra eye on the systems. And we're paying attention to whether we have enough capacity basically to absorb those and, and uh, trying to actually be able to absorb some multiple of those. Um, there is no scaling magic bullet. So it's really just about making sure that uh, we're doing our best to keep ahead of that curve. Great. Um, next question, with chips now being widely utilized, e-commerce is now being targeted as the low-hanging fruit for fraud. Can you talk about any efforts to help out with additional fraud prevention and tooling? Well, so I think philosophically we've talked a lot about fraud internally and, and really this for us would sort of fall in the PMD functionality. So um, fraud, I, I don't think that street people will do anything sort of natively build that anything on side anytime soon. Uh, it's probably a trap we can fall into where we see good volumes and so we start to say, hey, maybe we can add some value there. Fraud is, fraud for one thing is, is very verticalized. So what uh, someone selling $10,000 pieces of jewelry sees and what someone selling digital goods sees in terms of fraud and what someone selling low-hanging consumer goods is, 
it's a, a very, very different. So the first trap is sort of falling into a maybe you know fraud as a, a single amorphous blob. Um, for us, I think we would be very interested in working with fraud providers. So, so phase one, PMD, we have customers using PMD today to pass cut data out to third party fraud services uh, and to and to you know apply those rules and then come back and decide if it was transaction or not. Uh, there are also many customers that use SIF signs with us that actually sits on the front end and, and doesn't even need the cut data the way they function. Uh, I could see a world where we might uh, get more excited about helping. Uh, I think an interesting use case for us is sort of what if we went and did a first class set of receivers uh, via PMD, uh, all pointing out the three to five four providers and enable our customers to kind of A-B test or even route based on uh, based on different rules they have, based on those skill sets of those providers. I think those are things we would do and would be really interesting for us to do. But, I, but I, again, I think that's just extending this little PMD functionality we have versus us getting into the forward, providing a, a spreading maybe forward solution. Yeah, I think it hits one of the really interesting um, questions we're always asking ourselves. What should we build, be building in discreetly and what should we be enabling our customers to build on top of discreetly? And finding the right place to sell on that line is really important because we can dedicate more resources to allowing you to build things on top of Spreedly and we're not spending a bunch of time trying to build things into Spreedly. Um, but we also, there might be some unique set of services that only we can do at our point in the stack and we want to make sure that we're building those things for you. So we're always making that, trying to balance those things. So Ryan, this one's for you. Um, as you grow uh, the Spreedly engineering team, what are some of the things you try to keep in mind to have a productive engineering environment? Um, there, are many things. I, I don't know if you all are familiar with uh, some of the stuff we've done with the hiring process. We, we try to talk about a lot on, on the engineering blog and, and in other places too. But um, you know, we I think one of the great things about Spreedly and, and really it's about the people within Spreedly is um, I think for the pretty much across the organization, I feel like we're very deliberate about what we do. So you know, when we hire somebody, it's we, we don't just put the post up, see what we get, and, and kind of you know just talk to people and see who, who feels like the right fit. We've sat down ahead of time. We've created kind of a, a job description, almost like an internal job description of this is what this role entails. For positions like on the engineering team, these are, these are roles that have been well flushed out you know, many years now and they, of course continue to be refined. But you know we have this internal description. Everybody has the same target, whether it's for promotions or hiring in. This is, this is the single source of truth for what this job, what this job entails. It's, it's the thing by which everybody's measured to that's in that role, people coming in. So, um, you know, we've identified, and, and if you look at these job descriptions, they, um, they tend to have four-ish categories. Um, there tends to be, you know, technical competence. That, that's kind of the basic one. That's usually pretty easy to measure. Um, but then we have, you know, we ask a lot of our engineers. We, we really try to push responsibility down to the people that are doing the day-to-day -day work. So we uh, are looking for not just strong technical people or not just people that are strong in the, you know, the core definition of their role. We're, we're looking for things like maturity, um, good organizational skills, communication skills. You know, I, I think maybe things that might traditionally be thought of, of as soft skills. Those are really important. And when I look at kind of our hiring across roles, those tend to be the areas where uh, strong candidates really distinguish themselves um, from others. So um, there, there are lots of specifics within that. There, there are some posts we have online, but, but those are kind of the, the axes by, wit, by which we are looking at when we try to bring people on and make sure that, that they're a good fit. Um, I think something also that, that is really important is that you know, even though we, I feel like we're, we're kind of a tweener uh, as a company, like we're, we've been around for seven, eight years now in the current form, um, you know, revenue or projections and whatnot are, are you know, enjoyable at, at this stage. Uh, so we're, we can't, we're probably not considered a startup by some measures, but I think our mentality internally and the people that are really successful with us and, and how we kind of view ourselves is still as a startup. So people that really flourish in that type of environment um, tend to do really well here and that bringing those type of people on board just makes my job so much easier. You, know, you don't have to ask these types of people to do work. They're looking for work for ways to contribute. And so those are some of the things that really helps as we grow up. Um, makes my job a lot easier. 
Hey. Justin, you, you mentioned earlier about the importance of data. This question asks, do you internally track gateway uptimes and outages? Oh, uh, I think the question is probably more around the proactive. Uh, so we certainly know when a gateway's down, uh, we look at, uh, but it's always, um, it, it's not, it's not something, we, we've talked a little bit about internally, but you could almost do a marketing type service where we could track gateways, you know, publish something that showed their uptime, like what's the uh, MI up or whatever. Like yeah. That, that, uh, uh, down for everyone or just? Down for everyone, yeah. yeah. So we, we thought about building some services around it. We, but when you support, well, the interesting thing, when we support 100 gateways, as you know, there's always an 80 20 rule, and so many of those gateways might only do 10, 20, 50 trans, we might only do 10 or 20 or 50 or 100 transactions a day on behalf of one or two clients. So where it, it, so they may go, sometimes it's probably an example where Gateway's gone down for a full hour, come back on, and we've never tried to talk to it, and we've never even necessarily noticed. So, um, so we are not doing anything proactively where we're, you know, keying the Gateway or running a test transaction uh, every five seconds or every one second to see if they're up. Uh, most of, for the for the bigger volumes, we know, you know, immediately it's real time. Uh, but there's a long tail gateways for, for which um, it can be a customer that comes to us and says, hey, uh, this gateway is, you know, we're getting your message and we're going to investigate it. So, um, so it's a mixed bag depending on the volume of the gateway that we have. I'd also add there, there's a, um, a long tail of what exactly an error state or error condition is. Um, like, what does it mean to be up? A lot of times there's, um, it's just, Maybe the return times are slowly increasing. Maybe it's failing for this type of transaction. Maybe it's failing with, um, for this IP address. Or like, There's so many variables that go into that that it's really hard, especially at an automated level, to say conclusively, this is down for everybody or down for even just you. So that there's a lot that goes into that pot. Yeah, I think we want to do more with that going forward. I mean, there's definitely an opportunity. I just said how hard it is. I <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, so, um, I, but it, 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 it's going to require a lot of analysis. Anomaly detection is really difficult. Um, the whole industry is struggling with how to do this in, in our stats and system stats and system metrics. And it's even harder when it's a party that's one removed from you and not your own systems. Um, but we have data. We're getting more data. I think there will be a lot more we can do with that in the coming years. Okay. As one of the largest concerns for providers right now is data privacy. How are you handling uh, buyer data with respect to the new GDPR requirements? So it, it's a GDPR compliance question. Mm -hmm. yeah, so uh, where's LA we go with strategy? Right there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so so we, we do plan, I think there's a couple, so we do plan on we are GDPR compliant. Um, we have a GDPR DPA, uh, if you'd like for us to sign. Uh, if you'd like for something from us sign, we have the GDPR uh, DPA. I think where we're a little bit fortunate is two ways. PCI is, is obviously a uh, fairly strict set of regulations. So as a small company, we've been trained from the ground up to uh, have a lot of regulations in place and, and a lot of controls in place. Uh, and then the amount of actual data we see is pretty limited. We're not you know, a marketing company. We're not um, even in, uh, an expansive or payments company that might be trying to take an address, a shipping address, and things like that. We're very we're handy. <coughs> Just credit card data, so um, which is important, but it's also a fairly limited subset of data. So, uh, so that's what we're doing. We we have a fairly international customer base, so uh, we've been announced about GDPR early on, and um, and have gone through the process, consulted with lawyers, consulted with bigger companies in the space that look like us, and talked to their uh, likely for them, they have sort of these dedicated GDPR teams, and. and um, and, and so come up with uh, our processes and come up with that DPA. I think if you, if you need more information, I know if you email support, we have um, a lot of stuff we can send you with more details. Also, uh, I believe we're going to have a public facing page go out very shortly that will be accessible to everybody that kind of goes into some details around what our GDPR stance is and what your responsibilities are and where we see that, that division of responsibility. Right. And overall, we see our goal is enabling customers to be compliant primarily because you need, we're storing your data. Um, and so we'll be 
initially manually handling uh, requests as they come in, because we just don't know how many there were. We were, uh, whatever the previous one was. What privacy was shield? Privacy yeah. shield. And we were doing some research where we got, we're getting spooled up on GDPR, and we looked into the, the uh, arbitrator, uh, the arbitration service, and they had had like two uh, requests under like, no, zero requests. No, they had one that got withdrawn or something. Right? Yeah, so they had like one or two and they got withdrawn over the course of like two years of that program. And this is the whole arbitration and they were the free ones. So we figured lots of people were probably on board with them. So we don't know what the volume will be around GDPR. So initially we went into the longer term will be enabling you to have the tools that you need to manage the data for your customers. Okay, what are your thoughts on the idea of tokenization of things that are not payment methods? Uh, and do you see Spreely only supporting payment-related tokens, or do you see the future including more token types? Yeah, we're a payments company. I mean, um, we've had requests around social security numbers and HIPAA data and, and that sort of stuff, and that is outside of our um, purview, interest. Um, we, really wanna, we really wanna focus in on payments, on payments APIs, on payments product, and that's what we build, um, and what we're excited to build. So we're, we don't plan to tackle other things. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a relatively common question because we have a fault, because we tokenize. Uh, we see people come in who are maybe primarily looking for a fault for all the things first, and, and payments might be a, self, a section of that, but we're we may just sitting there early after and then just continue focusing on payments uh, and, and not be a, a secure vault for all the things. I think one thing that, that you've talked about a lot is um, Vaulting a thing and tokenizing it is great, but then what do you do with it? And so that's where all the domain specificity comes into play or, or the vertical industries that, that that piece of information relates to. And so that's where a lot, all the hard work is, really. I mean, a lot of our engineering effort is not on the vault itself that was done once and done well. It's now, what do, what do you do with that information? So um, it, it's less about tokenization and more about what you're doing with the data after that. that really comes into play and kind of guides what we, how we think about things. <laughs> Social security. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, just, we just love payments APIs so much we really want to deal with healthcare APIs. Yeah. <laughs> Walking off that stage. <laughs> okay, can you describe what happens when uh, a single payment gateway goes down? How is it communicated and resolved? Okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, this is for you, Ryan, sorry. Yeah, so there's, um, I mean, we would view that as an incident, right? So we have an incident response process. Um, hopefully you've only had very few instances to have to interact or care about that, but you know, if a gateway is down, um, it, it, it's, we talked about anomaly detection before. Um, you know, we don't have systems that will automatically create issues and, and, and whatnot when, when one gateway is down. It's not to say we don't have visibility and alerting, that's not what I meant to say. So we, um, you know, there's the detection phase, like is this an issue, right? So we see either customers written in or it's a high volume gateway um, that is down hard and we've noticed it via our various alerting and whatnot. So we will, at that point, determine is this an incident? So there's a basic triage phase. Is this an incident or is this, um, you know, something on the gateway side, or is a customer doing something wrong, right? So you kind of have to dig in to understand where the issue is. But at that point, that if it's a gateway down, it, it is an incident. We open a, a public status incident, and we communicate um, as we kind of dig in and understand what's happening. Is there any remediation that you can do? Um, is there anything we can be doing? Or is it just purely on the gateway side? So it's really about, at that point, transparency and, and trying to put workarounds in place, or at least educate you about what you can do. Yeah. I think one of the most fun things we get to do when somebody says the gateway's down is try to figure out what's actually going on because it could be the gateway, it could be us, it could also be the customer. Uh, just the other day, somebody wrote in and said, this gateway's down, and we looked and said, well, there's transactions, and it was a low volume gateway anyhow, and they said, oh yeah, I rebooted my server, everything's fine now. Um, so sometimes we, we really have to dig in and figure out, is this uh, actually an issue freely to break something after, did an SSL cert go out of date that we need to update, or is this happening at the gateway? And we need to make sure the customers have the information that they need, and a lot of times we have more visibility, but at the end of the day, we need to follow up with the gateway and find out what's going on.
There's definitely a lot of opacity in this industry, and I think we always try to lead with transparency. So we're hopefully we are giving you information about why a transaction failed and, and the error response and whatnot. And um, in the transaction transcript itself, which is kind of like just a, a text stream of the state of the connection to the gateway. Like we're trying to give you the tools so that you're empowered to be able to make those determinations yourself. Um, but you know that only goes so far. There's still a lot of work that that we do on our side to determine what's what's actually happening. Okay, here's a uh, follow-up question on, uh, on Spreedly's roadmap. How does the evolution of real-time payments methods and systems impact Spreedly's roadmap? Real-time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if there's clarify any, uh, that. Yeah, if anyone could ask that, that question and wants to add some clarification or... Uh, or Feel free to submit again. Yeah. yeah. Maybe somebody else. Um, what tech in your stack do you do you most regret adopting? <laughs> <laughs> Oof, we are getting tough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I often say that a lot of this stuff is my fault. I apologize to the employees because they have to deal with stuff that I did in the past, so I guess I, I guess I could go. I think one of my biggest regrets, it's not a technology in general, but it's a particular use of the technology. We adopted uh, Redis for a particular layer of our indexing uh, and for a period of time and kind of didn't pay close enough attention to it to the point where it was swapping massive amounts of data out of this, and so even extricating ourselves from that use kind of involved doing rocket surgery and flight. So that was a uh, yeah, I think if you um, if you read any of our postmortems, like we try not to name specific technologies or vendors, despite what Nathaniel just did up here, which is a, a close. Read. <laughs> you said this for other things, though. It's yeah, and we're really very happy with it, right? It's, it's so it, I would say that, it, and, and culturally too, a lot of what we try to do is make sure that as engineers, we are making well reasoned decisions, but are also acknowledging that one week from now, six months, two years, the, the same factors that were relevant and good factors or, or, or a good approach to making a decision that led to um, a certain choice may no longer be relevant. That's not, it doesn't make it a bad choice. It's just that now we have more information than we did before, and so maybe we would have made a different decision. So I think there, there are a lot of things in our stack that have pretty heavy trade-offs, like uh, you know, REAC. We, we had a lot of lightning talks about REAC and what that choice has meant for our architecture. Um, and so we get a lot of great benefit from it, but a lot of hardship too. And I think we are still of the mindset that those trade-offs are worthwhile and valuable. Um, but, but that applies to, to any decision too. So I, you know, maybe using Redis in that way, maybe it was the right decision at the time with what we knew. Um, but we tend not to be pretty hard on, on our technical choices. And I, I, can't, I can't point to any one point in time where we made a decision and like immediately had to, to back it out. I'm still pretty glad that back when we started CORE, we did not use Mongo. <laughs> well done. Good even, choice. Yeah. Even though, even though React has had its problems, still really happy yeah. that we did not use Mongo. I, I, think, I think one thing, if I, from a engin pure engineering perspective, if I could snap my fingers and change, again, not to say it was a mistake, is using Ruby. We, so we use Ruby for our core processing systems. Every time there's an API call out to another gateway, it's a Ruby process sitting there holding open that connection. It's very resource intensive. Ruby does not, doesn't have a great concurrency story and it's why um, we've really started investing in Elixir and basically every new thing that's happening in the platform, I can say pretty much without exception, is Elixir based. Just has much better performance characteristics for our use case. So I think Ruby was a good choice at the time. The ecosystem was so much, I mean, so, so different eight years ago. Um, now, though, I would love to snap a finger and, and have another language in there. Okay. Uh, what are Spreedly's plans for countries where credit cards are not the dominant payment method? That echoes an earlier question. That, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I think that question is a good question. I think that would fall under their old payment payments. Right. I would probably talk about that. Fair enough. I, um, I understand building payment service, uh, building a payment service is not easy, but it's not obvious to people outside of this domain. Could you elaborate why building a payment solution is hard? 
Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll lead off. Uh, kind of maybe the most obvious way that it's hard is the, um, and maybe this is specific to our place within the, the payment stack, but um, a lot of companies out there are good at financial and transaction processing, not good at building technology that exposes those functions. And our job is to integrate via APIs and via technology with these companies. So we are having to take on a lot of pain. That's our business though, like we're, we're taking on that pain so you don't have to. Um, but man, it makes, it makes what we do hard and uh, there's a lot of overhead. Uh, we've learned a lot, we've done hundreds of integrations at this point, so we've got a really good system and really good engineers that know how to deal with these types of things. But it doesn't make it easy. Um, a lot of times it doesn't make it fun. Um, so that, that's certainly one, one pain point. I think an interesting experience for me is when we began, we really just focused in on startups, and so everybody who was coming along and signing up and using us was like, oh, this is great. Like, this would have been two developers for me, five developers for me, and, and God forbid I'd have to do PCI compliance, but that just scares the heck out of me. Um, and so the, the logical question was, well, what happens when we start, when they become bigger for our customers, or we go in and talk to larger prospects, and um, I remember going into a large company, and and uh, asking them, why wouldn't you just build what we have? And they said, oh my God, the pressure we would have to, you know, to build it, to get it certified, and then if we wanted to make a change, we'd have to go through six, nine, 12 months worth of internal IT approvals and get that change, versus if I can procure it as a service and, and make changes real time. So, um, so that was pretty eye-opening. So I think it depends on the stage you're at, and some people, if they're smaller, they're, the, the blessing of us is, is the fact that they don't have those resources to build something like Spreakly. And then larger companies that have the resources that could replicate it for them, it's like, oh, it, it would still be problematic for maybe a business change. And or it's like, yes, but I want to go and deploy those things, deploy those resources on, on what we do as a value add and, and doing three bees as a value add for us to have to do it is, is way more cost effective or, or sensible. Yeah, I think there's kind of like two questions actually sitting in there. And one is what makes Spreakly hard or what makes uh, a company that's fully just focused on financial technology challenging? And then there's what what makes a business that needs to do financial technology things challenging? I think those are like, I don't think Spreakly is particularly more difficult than any other business. Every business has a problem that's going out and solving. And one of the awesome things is that we get to focus in on this financial payments technology problem and do it full time. And a lot of our customers, like, it's just 5% or 10% of what they need to do, and they would much rather just focus on the rest of the business. So we get to take that piece and make it much easier for them to go and tackle it. We've had, like just was saying, plenty of, of startups that have, and smaller companies, growing companies that come and said, we couldn't have done what we did if you didn't take this off of our plates. It would have been difficult for us to tackle that because it would have been a full-time job that we could only give this much of our time to it. Um, so, yeah, and then what makes our business hard specifically? Compliance, security, um, uptime in particular around, like, it's not a consumer service. It's not like Facebook where I can just throw some percentage of, of consumers at a particular page and then find out, oh, it's airing out. Let's take them off that again. Um, we have to be really a lot more careful and deliberate. We still deploy multiple times a day. Um, and, and many times a week, and we built the system that way. But that's been a lot of work to be able to do that with a high throughput transaction system. Uh, would you consider offering a private link API for AWS customers? Maybe. Um, <laughs> that's probably an enterprise feature, so we have some enterprise salespeople here that would love to talk to you about that. Um, but we're, we're currently in the process of getting into AWS. I think we'll have a lot more options. Um, once we're done, we're iterating through, basically standing that up, so it'll be active, active. And once uh, the majority of the service is active in AWS, we can start looking at some more specific features around uh, co-located customers in AWS. No idea about that. <laughs> what do you what do you look for from a cultural fit perspective when you're when you're looking to hire? Also, oh, from a cultural fit perspective, uh, and we've been talking about this. Uh, like all companies, we've learned from trial and error. Uh, you know, it's, it, I think the most challenging thing is when you hire a really smart. Like, it's easy to hire somebody who 
struggles in the role, maybe with grading of you, clearly doesn't have the skills to do it, it you know, it doesn't work there, they're stressed, you're stressed. I think that the interesting thing is when you have someone who's clearly quite gifted, quite bright, uh, knows how to do their role, but they don't fit in, in your company, it's not working for them, it's not working for you. Uh, and we have realized and talked about that a lot internally where, um, and Ryan talked about us as a startup, um, but many startups have a different culture than we do. So many startups uh, are VC funded, they have a board, they have very hands on C level leadership, and, and that board VC C level is really, really driving the culture, driving the engine, driving the direction and people are given orders to go and execute those orders. Uh, and, and that can be very exciting. Uh, a lot of people like working in the environment. Uh, there's a mission, you're going out and changing things. Uh, but, the, but the decisions are usually made in that small hub and then the, you know, the orders are given and it sounds a little over the top, but like direction's given and people go on and execute that direction. Uh, at Spreely, what we do is we have much more dis uh, dispersed control out to the group. So, we all understand we're trying to build this payment infrastructure that has a lot of uptime. How you decide whether you're in engineering or whether you're in sales, or whether you're in success, how we go and execute against that, a lot of that decision making is pushed out to people uh, to make those decisions and, and to run and make mistakes and get things right. Um, so where we've struggled is with people that are bright and good, but they're looking for more guidance and more hands-on direction. It, sometimes that's as simple as because you know, we've hired them in uh, and they're too inexperienced and shame on us because we're not giving them the guidance that they need. Uh, so we learn that lesson. But sometimes it's senior people have just come out of that sort of culture where they're like, wait, I'm waiting to be told what to go and do and then I go and execute that. Um, and we're saying, okay, well, that's not how we work. And so, you know, this is like latency, I guess, right? Like back up there waiting for us and we're waiting for them. So I think that's the, the sort of thing we've learned. And, um, and I think the final sort of piece is just another interesting thing. Uh, early on, big family, you know, big families. The founders had a lot of uh, a lot of kids, a lot of families. So we were not the place that's like doing the keg at six p.m. Like we we're like, see you later. You know, we're gonna get out here. We got lots of kids to do. So uh, take care. Of lots of things to do. So I think sometimes for people that are excited about that, that if you know someone moves to this area and they're in their 20s and they're, they want to take a job and they want to meet people and they want to you know, socialize, like that's a good ex component of taking their role. We not, might not be the best place for them. They're really like, <laughs> five for this, five, see, I'm going, I'm going. It's like, hey, who's here for seven? Who's going for drinks? Like, we just don't do that well. And I work at startups that did that well, so when we first started, I have like, these like, oh, I can't be eating that thing for those people too. But you realize we can't be that thing for those people. So, um, so sometimes it's like that cultural, social, um, a lot of startups are an extension of your, your personal life, and that's really fun and exciting. We don't offer that. Justin just thought about this at all. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say that uh, we're in the middle of hiring for an engineering manager, and, and you know, we think about hiring a lot. I think it's not an, an exhaustive or exclusive list, but you know, self-direction is very important. Um, positivity um, and maturity and I think inquisitiveness, like those tend to be properties of people that do really well at Spreedly. Um, so throw that out there. And, and I will say too, like just straight up, we do we have to do background checks because we're handling lots of credit card data. It's really sensitive stuff. And so character matters a lot too because we're hiring. Um, and we've, we've actually, we learned to be pretty strict around that. Um, so it's important. So if you got that ticket while you're driving the dominoes in your early teens, we can't have it. So this question is in the context of uh, payment method distributions of PMD. Uh, how do you scale new merchants quickly for PMD? PMD is great because we have to do very little work, we <laughs> being Spreedly. Um, you know, it, it, it's a pretty low level type of integration. We provide some, some basic framework and you know, a templating language, and you kind of have to do all the work. So a lot of our overhead is more around the compliance of that particular endpoint. You know, they're not a gateway, so that a lot of times they're not listed on, in the normal list, and it's not easily verifiable that they're PCI compliant. So a lot of our overhead is more at the administrative side of 
confirming their compliance, um, and then it, it's an ongoing thing. You don't just confirm a compliance once, and, and you can go for years on them. So it, there's, there's that bit of overhead. Um, but at the end of the day, you're having to do a lot of the integration work and understand their API. We're kind of hands off. Um, and it's, it's hard because we, you know, if we get a support request and somebody's struggling with a PMD integration, uh, you know, we want to help out, and I think, I think we do. We, we try to do our best to, to point you in the right direction. Um, but, but that line of responsibility is further on your side than it is for a gateway integration or where, where there's a, a known common vocabulary and common way to integrate that, that we can then expose to you. Much more open-ended. Yeah, I think it's an open area of exploration for us too. Um, potentially adding more structure on our side, not just from a technical perspective, but also potentially from a business perspective, and maybe striking up some partnerships so that when there is that problem, we can help our customers reach out to uh, uh, to the to the endpoint. So we'll see more developments maybe coming. It's that balance between functionality and flexibility, right? So we can give more. We can try to give more structure. Uh, a lot of times that that might. Um, might cut you off from some things that you, you want to do. Great. Uh, what's the latest status on uh, Google Pay integration? <laughs> oh, so we're not supporting that. No. <laughs> uh, so Google Pay is in private beta. Uh, I think I talked about it. Maybe someone can't wait for it live because I talked about this uh, in the first presentation. So Google Pay is available in private beta. Uh, contact success, contact your account manager if you're you're interested in participating now. I think as Didi said, uh, you see her around, talk to her as well. She's uh, doing the implementation, so she'll have a lot of the gory details if you're interested in that type of thing. I mean, I think literally we got our first payload going back and forth yesterday. Didi did, she's been cranking on it. So we're in the process of getting production activation, so we're just building a list of beta of customers that uh, are site to try that out as we get them. And I think if, if you're familiar with how we've done Apple Pay and even Android Pay, it, it should feel very similar to you. So uh, if you have that as a reference, good starting point. Great. Uh, the next question is probably a little more in depth for 527. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll park that one. No, because uh, I, right. no, I know. I <laughs> know. Skip it all together. No, right I know exactly what the last question is. Um, let's see. We were told that Happy Hour started at 530. That's right. 10 minute walk. Ah, uh, that's, that's true. That's true. You just said we weren't into partying like after hours. You're like, yeah. Keg! Keg's at 5 <laughs> So uh, last two then. We'll, we'll, we'll see, end on, on two. So um, can you describe your relationship with gateways? Uh, relationship. So there's 100 of them, at least 120 that we support. So there's no... Uh, Single answer. We uh, we have some gateways that we work very very closely with. Um, and I think actually the first step is what's the gateways culture like, uh, you know. And, and so uh, I think early on many gateways saw us as a competitor to sort of payments APIs or tokenization, sort of transparent redirect or an iframe. Freaked out. Uh, the good news is I don't think we run into that. Um, and then I think they would sort of fall into two categories that sort of see us as a necessary evil or it's like, okay, I guess they're using them, I don't really get it, but I'll play ball, they're not taking the, they're not taking the processing from me. And then the other uh, group would be people who totally get the value, we share a lot of merchants with them, uh, a lot of transactional buying, a lot of uh, processing buying goes across. So, um, so, so we sort of in those two categories, uh, I think the good news for, for you is the, the more, you know, the larger the gateway, the better the chances are we're doing a fair bit of buying with them. And, and they work well with us. We have uh, account manager relationships. We have technical contacts. We have support contacts. But again, there's 120. So uh, there are many that um, we support on a technical level, but we don't have account management or very deep relationships there with those, uh, with those gateways. Right. Um, so there was. One other question that was that was a great one, but I'm going to conclude on this last one, which is why the name Spreedly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, first of all, it was L Y everything when we started Spreedly, and we were fanboys. Started fanboys. Um, but basically, uh, the original founders we, we we started out as a subscription management service, and so the original founders we just needed a code name. So the first, very first name of Spreedly was Subnut. Um, so you can all be glad it's not. <laughs>
also <laughs> called Subnet. And so the four original co-founders all threw names into a hat, and um, we used a Condorcet method, a uh, ranked voting method, and we voted. And um, let's just say there's lots of names in that list. I went back and looked at it. There's a bunch of them. You're really glad we didn't pick those and you're not coming to the conference for SubCal. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and Spree that came out on top. Shopping Spree was the kind of tie-in there. Um, but uh, yeah, so put together the, the time period and the LY everything and Shopping Spree. Someday we'll come up with some great, completely fictional backstory like they had. Um, but yeah, mm -hmm. Pestum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Justin now wants to go write a completely oh, fictional backstory. <laughs> 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 All right. Okay. Well